Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Stephanie Mueller with the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce, and we are so excited to bring to you the first in a new series. Uh, so uh, we have an amazing partnership with Shakely. Uh, Don Hicks is our representative from Shakely, and he has graciously agreed to do a speaker series monthly with us um, entitled Raising the Bar. So today is the very first one, Diversity in the Workplace. Um, we will record these and then keep these housed on our website. So you may feel free to share with uh, your coworkers or anyone else that you feel this information would be beneficial to. If you do have questions along the way, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat box or feel free, we have a small group today that you may unmute yourself. Uh, Don is happy to take questions along the way or he's happy to take them at the end uh, whenever they might pop up. Uh, but definitely if you have one, type it into the chat box so that you don't forget. So without further ado, I would like to introduce, introduce to you Don Hicks. Very good. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to the first ever Raising the Bar with the Medina Chamber. So I could not be more proud of the, of the partnership with the Chamber. And thank you, Jacqueline and Stephanie, for all that you do um, for your members and for the partnership with Shakely. So very happy to be here. As Stephanie mentioned, uh, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. This is a really important topic um, in our communities, in our workplaces today. So you taking the time out to attend this, we really, really appreciate that. Um, and um, again, Don Hicks with Shakely, I'm an HR and risk management consultant. And I've been working with businesses um, now for my 24th year, if you can believe it. So very happy to be talking about this topic. So I always like to first start with um, a story. Everyone likes a story, okay? So Simon Sinek, some of you may know of him, S-I-N-E-K. If you don't, uh, Google him, TED Talk, he's phenomenal. Um, he is the Aristotle or the Socrates or the Plato, in my view, um, of our modern times. And no one understands human science and behavior like Simon Sinek. But I think there's a story that I learned from him that's appropriate for what we're going to talk about today. Okay. So as I go through this story, pick up two moral lessons from the story as you listen to this and just see if you pick up on that. So in the 17th century, okay, I'm sorry, 18th century in the 1700s, there was a disease that started in Europe and eventually made his way to the United States. And it was called, uh, I have trouble pronouncing this, but it's called puperal um, fever, also known as the Black Death, Black Plague of Child Deathbed. And what was happening is, started in Europe and went to, uh, to the United States, what was, what was happening is, as mothers gave birth, within 48 hours, they would die. And in some hospitals, the death rate was about 70%. Again, started in Europe, and eventually made his way to, to the United States. This disease was just savaging. Um, it lasted for almost a century, believe it or not. But remember, this was the 18th century. This was an era of science and data, the Renaissance. So as doctors got involved and was trying to figure out what was causing this death, this fever, this plague, what they would do would do autopsies in the morning. I'm sorry, they would yeah, do aut autopsies in the morning and then deliver babies in the afternoon, trying to figure out what was happening. And this lasted for almost a century, that practice. Well, a doctor came along. You may remember this name, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes. And if you remember that name, he is the father of um, future U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he said, Doctors, you're the problem. What you're doing is you're not washing your hands when you do autopsies in the morning and then deliver babies in the afternoon. You're the problem. You're not washing your hands. And they looked at him and said, no, you are, you're crazy, Dr. Holmes. It's not us. Um, and that problem lasted another 30 years. 30 years. And then someone came along and said, listen, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, you are correct. Doctors are not washing their hands between autopsies and birth. And they changed their practice. And um, 
sterilizing their equipment and washing their hands, the disease went away and we've never even heard about it. So there's two moral lessons from there. One is if you have a practice and been doing something for a long period of time, doesn't make it right. And number two, don't you be the problem. So I love this story in return in, in terms of diversity. So let's really get into it. So today we're going to define diversity. We're going to talk about why diversity is even important in the workplace, ways that we are diverse, some examples of discrimination, legal protections, some best practices, and obviously um, answer your questions and have a discussion. So, okay, let's get to it. How do you define, define diversity? Okay, think about that. How do you define diversity in the workplace? Well, diversity is the difference in racial, racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, geographical, and education backgrounds. And as I studied this topic, some of those factors I really didn't consider until I started studying this, this issue. I always thought of race and gender, but it's a lot more than that when we're talking about diversity, particularly in the workplace. And it also extends to people with different opinions different backgrounds, different religious or political beliefs, sexual orientation, heritage, life experiences. All of this combined defines diversity and it is becoming more and more prevalent in our communities and more and more prevalent in our workplace. We are just a reflection of our, com of our communities in our workplace. So that's how, in the context of this discussion, how we define diversity. Well, why is diversity so important in the workplace? And some of this is common sense, okay? Um, it's mutual res respect uh, amongst employees, just looking out for your other common man and embracing diversity and embracing in inclusion. Also, it allows for economic empowerment of marginalized workers. So if you have a segment of workers in the organization, whether it's race or a religious belief or gender, um, if they feel marginalized, they can be segregated, they can be separated, they can be ostracized, and you are taking away job promotions or um, being able to uh, get promoted and so forth. And that in turn impacts their um, uh, economic being. Business reputation, business reputation is huge. Your organization does not want to be the organization known for not embracing diversity or more serious is uh, being known as a discriminatory organization. You don't want that to happen, not only for moral reasons, but there are financial reasons and reputational reasons as well. We talked about job promotion and employee development, but having access to an increased labor pool with increased talent diverse backgrounds, diverse genders, diverse capabilities, only increases productivity and revenue. And that's not an, an opinion. You, if you look at study after study, diversity, when you open up diversity within your organization, it does have an impact on the bottom line and looking out for, your, for the other common human being. When diversity is educated, communicated, um, embraced, and really paid attention to, what we find is there's less time spent on conflict resolution in terms of these characteristics. Less time you have to spend on conflict, the more happier the employees are, the more you can spend on growing the business or the strategy or the business objectives if your workplace um, is not subject to um, these issues. And quiet animosity, quiet animosity can simmer beneath the surface. So as an example, if I work in an organization and I feel that I am discriminated against, I am ostracized, I don't have access to promotions, I'm being treated unfairly, I may not say anything, you know, if that's my personality. And what happens is over time, this simmers and it brews and I don't say anything and I grow this animosity and it just doesn't help the employee and it festers within the organization. And at the water cooler or, or, or on lunch breaks, you have employees complaining. So when you pay attention to some of these issues, 
and really spend time and dedicate resources to it. And I'm not just talking financial resources. A lot of these thing, things can be done by some time, but it doesn't really have to cost a lot in order to embrace and educate on diversity. So, so what are some of the ways that we are diverse? And I talked a little bit about these already, and some of these may um, be unique to you, but obviously everyone knows the first one is how, how are we diverse is race, our skin color, okay? Another way that we are diverse is our gender and our sexual orientation. All of this plays into inclusion and diversity, particularly in the workplace. Another way is age, age discrimination. I, I am becoming, I am, I'm sorry, I am beginning to see more and more of this age discrimination. Um, more often than in the last, I don't know, 18 months than I ever have before. Um, I don't know exactly what's driving it. I think it is a combination of generations mer beginning to merge together, millennials um, and so forth with some of the older workforce. And there's some conflict and there's a friction there that uh, needs to be dealt with. I just had a case that had, had this issue about six months ago um, and it's becoming a problem. Um, people of a certain age, they have a lot of experience and a lot that the Millennials or the younger workforce can learn from. And if you tap into that energy, if you tap into that experience, um, regardless of age, um, there's a lot that we can embrace and learn and make sure that is not discriminated against if you have a mixed workforce in terms of um, someone's age. The other one, and this was unique, you may not have thought about this. We talked a little bit about it already, but education, education depending on the industry that you are in, uh, uh, that you are in, um, some employees may be educated formally, and I'm talking more formal education, bachelor's degree, graduate degrees, law degrees, PhDs, some of the former education. If you have a mix within your organization of employees with a formal education and some not, you want to pay attention to that because you could be building or have a situation where if someone does not have a former education may look down on someone that does or vice versa. So you wanna pay attention to that. Are you treating someone with a former education differently than someone that's not? Someone that doesn't have a former education can give as much if not more than someone with a former education. They have skills, they have trades, and they are just important to the organization. And you just wanna make sure you're not tilting your biases or promotions or um, opportunities to one group or not, not the other. And you also wanna pay attention to this uh, with your hiring practices, with your hiring practices. So just pay attention to some of those issues. Um, and having a mix is great. Everyone, regardless of education, brings their experiences, their talents, their ideas, um, regardless of any of these char characteristics that we're talking about today. Um, the other one is physical appearance, making some assumptions. Does someone have a tattoo? And you make a certain assumption. Does so is someone's hair, hairstyle a certain way? And you make an immediate assumption. Does someone dress a certain way? And you make an assumption. So incorrect assumptions can lead to intentional or sometimes unintentional biases just the way someone, uh, someone's physical appearance is. So you wanna pay attention to these signs. And we're gonna talk about that, about this uh, a little bit more as we sort of go through this presentation. And the last one is physical ability. People with disabilities, people with physical disabilities. Now, one of the things I am very passionate about that I, um, I, I see becoming a real, real, real problem is mental stress, mental illness, mental stress, along with physical abilities. So I want, if someone has a physical disability, they can give just as much, if not more, to someone with, without one. So you wanna make sure you're, you're paying attention to your hiring practices, to promotional opportunities, to accommodations for someone with a physical disability, um, and pay attention to, to that and embrace it. 
and embrace it. They have a lot to give to organizations and a physical disability has nothing to do with what they can contribute to the organization. Also, mental stress. Please, please, please pay attention to mental, mental stress. It's becoming a problem. Um, it is stigmatized. Unfortunately, it is stigmatized. I think we are trending to get better and better and better with mil- mental illness and mental stress. Obviously, the pandemic did not do, did not help this issue, but pay attention to those signs. Encourage your employees to embrace one another and check on one another. Um, if someone does show signs of mental stress, work with them, get them help, reach out to them um, because they, they are part of your community. They are part of your organization and you want to pay, pay attention and not ostracize them. Not saying, Oh my God, Don, he must be having a bad day. Is he, or is there something else going on? And you have to be very careful. And these are very difficult conversations. I get it. None of this stuff is easy. And I don't want to come across as making this sound easy. It's not. But I do want to educate you just to look for signs and um, encourage um, some good behavior in, in terms of these issues. So diversity, experiences and cognitive, how you view the world. Let's talk about experiences first. The first experience when it comes to diversity is different cultural backgrounds where someone was raised, what they believe in, their religious belief, their culture, their family makeup, their educational backgrounds, as we talked about, and traveling extensively, traveling extensively. I have a military background. I was in the Marine Corps, and I spent a year in Japan, um, lived in the community of Japan, and really, I think that helped me in terms of engaging with people, understanding people and embracing different cultures and languages and so forth. Um, Just being part of that. I have family that lives in Hungary. I have family that lives in Slovenia. I have family that lives in Croatia. I have family family that lives in Austria. So Eastern Europe, I have some family that live and have traveled traveled there as well on extended um, appearances. And all of that culture, all of those experiences has helped me in my job. It has helped me in working with, managing, engaging with other employees because, you know, various life experiences give me different perspective, per- perspectives, you know, and likewise for someone in your organization, you have different ideas, you have a different way of approaching something. You have a different way of resolving conflicts or understand understanding someone else's perspective. It determines how we see the world or the world view. Remember, diversity is not only on the race and the gender is that, but it's also political opinions, beliefs, religious belief or non-religious beliefs. That plays into it too. So all of these experiences determine how um, again, we embrace one, uh, one another and how we understand one another. And cognitive is just that, is understanding this. But one of the things I want to make sure that you pay attention to is geographical differences. And let me explain what I mean. Let me tell you a real quick story. It's something that I learned almost 30 years ago, okay? So you may not know, you probably don't. I grew, I did not grow up in Ohio. I've been in Ohio now for 30 years, almost 30 years. But I grew up in North Carolina in the South on a very, very small farm. My, the population of my community was about 800 people when I was growing up and going through high school. So that is the, 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 the culture and the world that I grew up in. Well, as I went to college, went to the Marine Corps, I came to Cleveland 30 years ago. And I remember when I first got to Cleveland, this happened to me. Well, in the South, um, regardless of age, whether you are eight, age 18 or whether you are age 88, um, calling someone ma'am in the South is normal. It's a term of endearment. Uh, and age has nothing to do with it. Well, when I had just got to Cleveland about 30 years ago, I had only been here, I think, a couple of months. I went into a meeting. I was with a friend of mine. And the receptionist greeted, greeted me, and she seemed to be in her mid-20s at the most. And she asked me a question, and I answered with, yes, ma'am. 
Um, and she looked at me and I could tell I had said something wrong, but I didn't know what I said. I meant no, Ill. it's just the way it was, it was a term that I was used to. Well, I went to my meeting and as I was leaving, I could tell she was really upset and I did not know what I did. As I was walking out, I was like, man, I talked to the other guy I was with and he said, you called her ma'am. I was like, oh my God. And it hit me at that point that just what I could do in the South, maybe I can't do in Cleveland. Just pay attention to that. So Northeast, Midwest, South, Southwest, Pacific Northwest, and West, we all have our different ways of engaging one another. And some things are unintentional and some things are intentional. So if you are learning or learning about someone and they come from a different geographical area, or maybe someone came from a different country, just pay attention to that. Um, as you are engaging in making decisions in regards to diversity. All right, diversity history. What influences diversity? The first one is parents. I want to be very careful, careful here. I don't want to come across as I'm telling anyone how to raise their kids. That's not what I'm doing, okay? Do not want to do that. But I do think that there's a place when we talk about diversity of we get some of our views from how we are raised and our parents. So is diversity explain or is it shh? And here's what I mean. Let me give you a quick example. We're going to have a frank conversation right here. Okay. So your parent and you're with your, let's just say you're with your six-year-old, you get on the elevator and someone comes into the elevator, this is a, that is a different race. The door is closed on the elevator. So is you, your six-year-old and a stranger of a different race. Your child says something that may be inappropriate. Do you say shh and let it go? Or do you take that opportunity to explain why diversity is important and really take the time? Don't know the answer to that, that's up for you. In your, in your family. But I think there is a tendency sometimes because these conversations are so difficult that a lot was just a shh and not explain versus taking an opportunity to talk about diversity and what's important to you based on how you want to raise your child. We also learn diversity from our teachers, our coaches, sports, different um, organizations that we are part of, our peers, who we hang around with. So I used to tell my son, my son is, he just turned 29. I used to, I used to tell my son that um, I can tell a lot about you, Randy, um, by the people you hang around with. By the people you hang around, around with would tell me a lot about who you are as a person. And I told him, told him that when he was very young and I stuck to that. Um, how many times, okay, we've all been there. How many times you may have been at a party or a cookout, and someone says something inappropriate, all right? Um, do you confront it? Do you ignore it? Do you bring it to the workplace? Do you not bring it to the workplace? Is it in the back of your mind? I don't know. So who we hang around with, our peers, um, plays into this. News, entertainment, movies, social media. By the way, algorithms. Let's take a minute to talk about algorithms. For a, for a little bit, because some people understand this and some people don't. So I'm going to take an opportunity to talk about this, is algorithms, Google, social media. Google, when we do internet searches, those internet searches are returned to you based on what Google thinks you want to see, based on your past behavior of searches. So if you do a search on something, and it's the same with Facebook, Twitter, all other forms of social media, just because you see it on social media or on the internet doesn't mean it's actually true. We all, we all know it's common sense, but I don't think a lot of people go the second step, meaning is it from a credible source, whatever I'm researching, or where, wherever I'm getting my news from the social media or the internet, am I using credible sources? Am I using multiple sources? Not just what Google is giving to me 
because it is algorithm based based on your your past behavior. So just pay attention to that to that. I, I, I have conversations with people and it was like, oh, my God, I didn't see that on Facebook or I didn't see that on, you know, when I type it up in Google, it's not my first result. And I was like, no, go to page two and go to this and look at this. This is an independent source. Here it is. So, you know, just pay attention to those things, things that we may not think about when we're doing our research or when we're getting our news or and making our opinions and making making some decisions. The importance of critical thinking. Taking time on some of these complex, sensitive issues for our workplace and for our organizations, critical thinking is very, very important. To, uh, to use. Now, what is silent diversity? What does that mean? Silent are those, silent diversity, I'm sorry, silent diversity are those unconscious biases, our hidden tendencies that we didn't think we, we had, those personal habits that we have. And some, to be honest with you, are unintentional. You know, just like my yes ma'am comment, just completely unintentional, did not really even think about that. But it could offend someone. It could offend, offend someone else. But those hidden tendencies, that silent diversity is treating others differently, even when you didn't, didn't mean to. Are your decisions tilted to one race or another? It, are your tendencies in the workplace tilted towards one gender versus, versus another? Are who you are deciding to promote and get into that training program are they tilted to one area or, or one characteristic or not? That raise that you decide to give someone, you know, all of those who you just decide to hire, all of those are that silent diversity and those hidden tendencies and those habits that we build over time. So by being aware of it, and by the way, we're not talking quotas. That's not what diversity is about. We're not talking quotas, and I do not want to give that impression. But you just have to pay attention to some of your practices and engagement um, and how you in, in, interact with other employees and people that's in your organization or work for you. You know, looking the other, looking the other way is a silent diversity. You know something happened. You know something is taking place that's not quite right, and don't say anything or look the other way. I don't want to get involved. You know, um, that's a problem. That is silent diversity. That that is us. That is in the in the area of talking about silent diversity, and the fear of not knowing what to say. And this is very legitimate because again, these are very very difficult conversations to have, and it's a difficult converse, uh, concept to embrace in some organizations. Remember that story about the um, the plague of ch uh, child deathbed. Just because something has been done a certain way for a long period of time, what, does not mean that it's right. So you can get frozen. You can get paralyzed because, hey, this is the, Don, this is the way we've always done it. And, and critical thinking, is that still the right way? You know, and the misplaced thinking that some have that says work is not the place for diversity. I own the business, it's my business, I'm going to run it. Understand? That's fine. But that's a price to pay for that in terms of business reputation, in terms of employees being happy, in terms of employees um, getting promotional opportunities and so forth. So that's some examples of some silent, um, silent diversity. And silence is just not an option. If you see something that is not quite right, um, say something. Take action. Okay. Let's talk about some examples of diversity. We talked a little bit about these, but unequal opportunity in employment decisions, access to certain training and apprenticeships programs, offensive comments. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But one is one that, as I did research on this topic that I didn't realize, is the segregation. The segregation of employees of a certain race, color, sex, religion, national origin, those protected classes, segregating them from the public. So if you have a warehouse and for whatever reason you have these group of employees that you sort of put off into a corner, they may not have the best education, they may be of a certain race or gender, they may have a physical disability, 
you're going to shield them from the public. On the surface, it may seem okay because of their job, descri job description, but you're segregating potentially as an example. Okay. So pay attention to that. Stereotyping those incorrect assum uh, assumptions based on those protected classes, race, religion, sex, so forth and so on. Okay. Basing your opinion on stereotyping versus um, an unbiased opinion. Sexual advances, jokes are not okay. Slurs are not okay. Offensive comments are not okay. Unwanted um, advances in physical contact is not okay. Um, telling the blind joke is not okay. You know, I cringe and I still hear it to this day when someone says the blonde joke and I have to stop them. No, cut it off. Done. Okay. So, um, not okay. Real quick story. Just a real quick story. True story. True story. I dealt with a case, got about three years ago where a supervisor, male, and a female person on the team at lunchtime used to go to the hotel um, right next door, right next to the business. And you can imagine what they were doing. And that male um, supervisor was paying for, for that activity. This went on for a number, no one knew about it, just those two. Um, one day, one of the owners the female went to one of the owners and says, listen, I need to make a complaint. This is what's been going on. No one knew what was going on. And the reason she made the complaint is because he didn't pay her. He didn't pay her. And it turned out to be a, a, a real, real bad scandal. You, do you know what's going on in the organization? Um, is training, communication, education, consistent education uh, and communication throughout the organization? She, she ended up filing a, a lawsuit against the managers, supervisors, and owners, uh, and be, it became a big problem. Um, so sexual advances, sexual harassment has no place, obviously, in the workplace. And then religion. All aspects of religion, cultural practices, and observance, observances are protected. Sincerely held moral and ethical beliefs of a religious nature are protected um, from a legal standpoint. OK, so just pay attention to that. We talked about what uh, we define. We define diversity from the very beginning. And it's those, those religious beliefs, our opinions, right, our cultural, our heritage, our background, our socioeconomic, all of those are examples of um, discrimination. So as we wrap up, let's talk about retaliation and what's protected activity in terms of uh, workplace diversity. The first one is, let's talk about retaliation. What does retaliation look like? When you see it, we talked about, right? Silence is not an option. What does retaliation look like? Retaliation is when an employer punishes an employee engaged in some type of legally protected activity. And we, we are going to define legally protected activity next. But examples, we talked about these a little bit, demoting someone disciplining someone, firing someone, reducing someone's salary, uh, changing their job shifts or their shifts assignment based on um, retaliation cannot be done. And if you are a manager, supervisor, owner of in leadership position, you want to pay close attention to this. It can get you into all kinds of trouble personally. It can get the company in all kinds of trouble as a workplace. Um, so be very careful of some of that activity. What is protected activity? Making a complaint, making a report of sexual harassment. These things happen. If it doesn't happen in your organization and, is, and if it's not happening in your organization, great. I hope that is not. But I deal with this stuff every, every day and these things happen. Unfortunately, these things still take place. And I know because I deal with this um, on a weekly basis. Filing a formal, formal complaint against someone, opposing discrimination, 
assisting another employee who is experiencing discrimination is protected, okay? Providing information um, during a valid investigation um, as a result of a discrimination issue is protected. Um, requesting accommodate, uh, accommodations for a disability issue is protected. And then obviously intervene, intervening to protect others. Remember, what? Silence is not an option. So intervening to protect others, do the right thing, the employer cannot retaliate against you, okay? So um, that's something to, to know. What are some of those legal protections? These are just some examples. Um, the first one is ADA, the American with Disabilities Act, um, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. That's more for federal employees and federal, um, those that work in, with federal contracts. So if you have a business that do federal government work, that bid on federal contracts, um, there are some legal protections um, in regards to discrimination and diversity um, around those. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, was passed in 2008, I believe, and became law in November of 2009, I believe. And that is protected information um, for genetic information employers discrimination based on family medical history or genetics. And this is becoming this, no one really knew about Gina until 2020 when it became more prevalent with COVID. So as employers were getting um, test results or proving that people weren't sick or did not have COVID or taking people's temperature and asking for some of that information, you have to be really careful. Does that information contain genetic information? If it does, you can get in trouble. It is a federal offense. And it's a federal law that protect employers from making certain decisions based on genetic information. So really, really pay attention to that. The Equal Pay Act is something that JFK, John F. Kennedy signed in 1963. It just says that um, you can't discriminate and make pay um, decisions based on gender men and women. It's a law that's been around a long, a long time. And EEOC, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, is a commission with the federal government that if a discrimination case is filed, they get involved and do the investigation, arbitration, and makes, making, making some of those determinations before it goes um, to court, if it goes to court. You do not want to be on the receiving end of a EEOC issue. It will make your life miserable. Um, if there are any attorneys on, on, the, on the call, you know, and dealt with this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So just some, some legal um, um, things there. So, okay, we're coming to the end. Let's play a little game before we wrap up. So myth, I don't have any prizes, but we're going to play a game anyway. So, okay. Myth or reality? Question. There is one best qualified person for every job. There is one best qualified person for every job. True or false or myth or reality? Myth. People bring different skills and talents to work. Not one person brings different skills. It's several candidates with the right combination to perform a job. Remember, inclusion, right? All right, next one. People of the same demographic group naturally get along better than working with other groups. True or false or myth or reality? Myth. Just because someone of a same dem demographic group does not necessarily mean they relate to another any better. Diversity exists regardless of any of those characteristics. Uh, characteristics. Skin color, gender. Um, just because someone of this gender doesn't mean they're going to get along with everybody of this gender. It doesn't work that way. And it's reciprocal. Men, women, and so forth. Okay. The last one, diversity programs only benefit minorities, only benefit minorities. Myth, effective, effective diversity programs include all races and ethnicities. And again, the key, um, the main operator of this is inclusion and treating everyone in the workplace fairly and equally. I did this presentation about a month ago, and I had a very interesting question come up. 
someone asked um, Don, in a workplace, is it two questions? Is it okay to create a group um, that talks about certain issues, like a minority group? So this certain race create three or four or five employees and they're going to get together and discuss, collaborate for them. Is that acceptable? In my view, yes. The second question, they said, well, could anyone that's not of that race be part of that group? So if you have a group of 10 employees as part of this minority group, as an example, can someone that's not a minority join that group? Is that okay? And my response was, absolutely. This is inclusion. If that person that wants to join that group has good intentions to learn, okay, um, and so forth, that's acceptable too. And I would highly recommend that. Okay, best practices. And then I keep saying we're going to wrap up, but we, but we will. Best practices. Some of these are common sense, respect differences, encourage all employees to thrive, see everyone as individuals and not as groups. Okay. Um, a long time ago, I love stories. A long time, this will be a quick one. A long time ago, someone says, you know what, Don? And I know them, and I know they didn't mean, they didn't mean any, anything by this, but they were wrong here. They said, this certain race, I'm sorry, this certain ethnic group, I just can't get along. For some reason, I just can't get along with them. Can't do that. That is no, and I had to correct them, right? Silence is not an option. You can't make that general generalization. I know, Don, but for whatever reason, whenever I engage this certain ethnicity, I just, nothing goes right. Can't do that, okay? That's a no-no. So look at people as individuals. If you want to say, that person didn't treat me right, that's fine. But you can't generalize and say, those type of people uh, didn't, I can, they never treat me right. Unacceptable, unacceptable. Promote diversity in work teams and experiences. Treat everyone fairly. We talked about that. Make sure your hiring practices, your HR policies are updated, acknowledged, and communicated. Diversity is a year-round thing. You know, this training, as an example, is a first step for some of you. Continue this, continue this type of training throughout the year. It's not a, it's not a one and done. Oh, I attended this diversity training and I'm good to go. It is constant um, communication, reminders, and so forth. And it doesn't take much time. I'm not saying you need to spend a half a day every quarter on it, but spend some time on it. Now, um, if you get anything from this presentation, and if you are a leader or owner of an organization, pay attention to this one, what, am I, what I'm about to say. Managers, Make sure managers and supervisors have the proper training. I can't tell you the number of times where you have an owner and then you have department managers. Department managers are not properly trained on diversity and they do something stupid in an interview or they make a stupid decision in um, uh, a termination. A, a lawsuit is filed, goes to the owner, owner said, what? Well, it wasn't me. It was my manager. Don't come to me. Go to them. And you can't do that. The owner is responsible for the managers and supervisors. So make sure that your managers and supervisors are trained, that they respect diversity, that they embrace diversity in order to keep you and the company out of trouble. Okay. Approach sensitive, to sensitive topics in a general way, a general way. Be, be respectful of other people's opinions and views. Diversity, if you, if you have a problem with diversity in your organization, it's not something that's going to go away, away overnight. And I'm not suggesting that it will. It, it could take some time, but that's okay if you're making progress. But attach, you know, start out in a general way and um, take it from there. And learn and use acceptable terms when discussing people who are different. Remember my little story, the yes ma'am comment, learn different terms, be familiar with them. And if you're not sure what a term means, don't use it. There was a real, there was a case about five years ago here in Cleveland. All you have to do is, is Google Fox 8 News anchor. Um, she mistakenly used a 
um, a term during her newscast that caused a big ruckus. They suspended her, I think, uh, five days or something, and it caused a big stir here in Cleveland, Fox 8 News. Um, when she explained it, she said, I don't understand. I think she was, I think she was sincere, but are you, it's public information, so I'm not saying something that is not public. But she said, I don't understand why this term was so controversial. I learned that term. I've, I've heard... As I was growing up, all of my family members members used to use this term. Remember, we talked about diversity history, parents, how you're raised, what you are exposed to. And she, she just heard this term and did not even think about it. But it ended up being a very insensitive term and it got her in trouble. And it got Fox 8 News in trouble as well. So just learn to use acceptable terms. All right, we are right on time, um, Stephanie. So that is my contact information on the screen. Feel free to reach out to me if you wanna have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I do not charge anything for, for talking to you and uh, it's unlimited. So I really appreciate you attending this. If you have anyone that um, you want to refer this presentation to or refer me to talk to and have a conversation with, no cost, no obligation. It is a benefit by being a member or considering being a member of the Medina Chamber. They do some fantastic work. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. So Stephanie, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you. And um, I'll take any questions if there are any. Thanks so much, Don. That was uh, fantastic information. If anyone has questions, feel free to type them in the chat or unmute yourself. As I said, there's, there's so few of us that we can certainly um, yes, ask questions of Don if you have any. Hi, Don, I have a question. Yes, Rebecca, thank, sure. Thank you for such a great presentation. Oh, thank you, appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Um, my question is, I'm sure there's a lot of larger companies and businesses that have diversity training for perhaps their manager levels, um, but, but may not want to invest the time or the money into training maybe their, their shift workers on the factory floor or in the warehouse, like you mentioned, or yeah. maybe even some smaller companies that may only have, you know, a dozen or fewer employees. Yeah. So how do we encourage them that this is to inform them that this training is important and will benefit them? That's a fantastic question. And I've been challenged in doing these presentations and researching this issue. That is a, that's a, that's a challenge for me to even answer effectively. It's a problem. And what I mean by that is larger organizations typically make the time or they have the resources or the personnel to do it internally and they just do it. Large organizations. Smaller organizations typically do not have that luxury meaning they don't have the, the internal expertise to take on a top, topic like this. They're so busy, people are wearing multiple hats and they're just trying to survive day to day. So it's a challenge and I agree with you, it's a challenge. The only recommendation I would make is, um, you know, as a best practice, maybe start out with a lunch hour, you know, bring in pizzas, you know, something fun um, before the company picnic. We can get back to things like that. Something to make it fun and not so threatening and not so septic or antiseptic, whichever the term, um, might be a good start and take it from there. You know, um, I, I argue when I talk to owners of small organizations, I argue that you have more risk than the larger organizations do. And sometimes when you have that frank conversation with owners of a company that um, you are more at risk because you just don't have, you don't have the resources for it. For example, if you get a discrimination lawsuit fall against you, and I see it all the time for small companies, you can not take on that type of financial risk versus a larger company with a thousand employees. You just can't do it. So if you talk about risk mitigation, if you talk about couching it in something that's fun and start out incrementally, incrementally, 
and, um, you know, you know, think about hiring companies or engaging with companies like a Shakely. We do this type of training for our clients all the time. And it's not very expensive to do train trainings like this is worth the investment, you know, a few hundred dollars and you can get a diversity class. So start out small, start out incrementally, appeal to the risk mitigation to the owners and then, and, and then broaden it out from there. So does that make sense, Rebecca? Does that help a little bit? That's yeah. what my recommendation would be. So, yes, thank you. You are, you're welcome. My, my question kind of piggybacks on Becky's there. Um, yes. And given kind of the, the issues that smaller companies have, um, what do you see that the chamber can do? I mean, I think this is a good start, but one thing we're trying to do with the chamber is really get diversity out there and push it. Yeah. Um, keeping in mind that our, our smaller employers don't have the resources. So yeah, I want to get your thoughts either today or maybe offline on what the chamber can be doing and, and doing better um, on the diversity front. Yeah, let me give this some thought. I mean, classes like this, to your point, Dan, is a first is a good first step. Um, you know, if and I think Rebecca, I, I don't think I addressed this with the, Rebecca's question, but if you have different shifts, you know, first shift, second shift, third shift, you don't want to do a training just for the first shift employees and forget about the second shift and third shift employees. What's the point of that? You only talking to a third of the population of the employee population. So you can, you know, there's webinars, there's courses, there's YouTube, there's things we can do remotely, there's recordings, there's things, there are classes that employees can take on their own time. There's learning, learning management systems where for just a fraction of a cost, not very expensive, that you can go on and take a 30 minute course on diversity, or you can subscribe to an online training center for managers and say, what are the, what are the interviewing, interviewing skills that you, that you need to have? And take these courses, 30 minute courses, two or three questions, and you get certified that you, you completed this course. So they're very cost effective relative, right? Relative but very cost-effective ways that even smaller organizations can do. But again, you can start incrementally. You can start with presentations like this, and I'll be happy to talk to any business for no cost on this topic. You know, we'll take an hour, bring in some pizza when we get to that point or whatever, and I'll be happy to do these type, type of uh, classes for any organization that's, that's willing to listen and engage this topic. No cost, free of obligation. Um, so start with that and then maybe look at, you know, some online courses that your employees can take on the evenings or weekends at their leisure and then build it from there. But even if you're a small organization, um, a few hundred dollars of, of an investment um, is worth it in the, in the long run. So, but I'll, to your point, Dan, I'll give that some thought um, with the chamber to sort of methodically and continuously roll out something for the chamber and for the members. Very good point. Thank you. Any other questions? I, if, I know we have just a couple minutes left. Yeah, but sure. Go, Take your time. I'll go ahead and uh, hog all the questions here. So, That's okay. <laughs> um, attracting diverse candidates is something that in Medina County and a lot of other counties that we do business in is, is difficult. So, I mean, do you have any tips on, on that front? And I'm, and I, again, I'm not just talking about racial or ethnic diversity. I'm yeah. just talking about not getting the middle-aged white male. Um, yeah. yeah. And any tips yeah. or tricks for us on that or, or how can we kind of directionally be, you know, start moving in the right, in the yeah. right direction there? I love this question. And I, and I tell you why one of one of the courses I've talked about, or one, one of the topics I've talked about is recruiting. I think most businesses do a horrible job at recruiting. I just put it out there. <laughs> respectfully, I say that respectfully, that most businesses do a horrible, horrible, horrific job at recruiting. And the reason I know this is because I look at job uh, postings and they're awful. Your job postings are awful. <laughs> so, they all look the same. And if I'm a candidate, right? If I'm a candidate and you make me go on your website and your website is horrible, uh, what? I don't, I don't understand it. So, so I would really think about the workflow of your, not you, Dan, I'm just saying in general, 
Um, so beef up your, your job postings. But to your point on a serious note, more serious note, um, think about spreading your net wider. And here's what I mean by that. And I'm trying to say this respectfully. Depending on where you are, some communities are homogenous. They have the similar demographics in, in a community, right? So if you in, in XYZ city, in XYZ city is homogenous, you typically just by numbers, you get those same type of characteristics, right? It's just math. But as you, if you spread your net out to more heterogeneous communities, more diverse communities, even maybe going, going outside the state of Ohio to attract talent in diverse communities, you will cast your net wider to attract them to come to your location. So, you know, and people say, well, Don, that might incur some relocation expenses if you if I go outside of the state of Ohio. Yeah. But if it's, if it's, is it worth $2,000 in relocating someone to your organization that has your skills and principles um, for $100,000 in revenue that they can bring in? I don't know. Is it? So m that's a long answer to your question, Dan. But I would say spread your net, your, 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 your search wider, because if it's, if it's a narrow search, 10 miles from your office, you may be just by numbers alone, you may be only reaching out to a certain char uh, group characteristic. It's just the nature of the, how the communities are built in some cases. Does that make sense? So, yeah. To, to feed off of that though a little bit, um, Don, I also serve on our school board for Medina City Schools. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, community members will question us, you know, that we don't have a very diverse staff. Yeah. And one of the issues we're finding is that there's not a lot of affordable housing in yes. our community. I mean, yep. they, I feel like even if we cast a wide net, we, we may cast a wide net to get some people from maybe more expensive states that it is more yeah. cost effective to live here. But right now it's just, I, I think that's one thing that plays into it. And I guess somehow we also, we have to get our community involved businesses we need to get the yeah. community involved too. So we're kind of have the same goals, I guess. Yeah. Now that's a very good point. Some of those socioeconomic, right? Some, some of those socioeconomic factors play into this, but you know, Hiring diverse candidates, if you have, if you do not have a flat organization, meaning if there are leadership opportunities, um, promotional opportunities, opportunities for that person to grow, that might be more attractive just on the salary that you offer someone. Someone that's diverse may want to come in if they know they have a pathway to leading a team becoming a supervisor, becoming a CFO, whatever the case may be, and appeal to that, that will help you also attract candidates. It's not just on salary. It's not just on salary. Employees look for other factors as well. Working remote from home, uh, training opportunities, leadership opportunities, leading a team. I've known people that would take less salary if they if they could get into a management position and learn some of those skills. So just know some of those demographics as well. Does that make sense? So yeah. I want to be respectful of the time, but I don't want to feel free anyone anyone on this call, I want to be respectful of the time. Feel free to reach out to me and have we have a one on one conversation, no limitation. Um, email me call me. Um, I'm very passionate about about this this topic. Um, and really appreciate the, the chamber giving me the platform to, uh, to talk about it. So, and we're going to be doing this, I think every, not diversity, different topics, but every Thursday of every month, every third Thursday of every month. Right, Stephanie? So, Correct. Yeah. yeah so this was our first one. Um, if you have suggestions for any future topics, I know Don is always open to those suggestions. He's trying to pick what are some of the more pressing topics uh, of the day for businesses that they're facing, but certainly uh, the third Thursday of every month at 10. Um, and then we will house all of these on the Chamber's website. So you'll be able to gain access to the one from today and then all the ones going forward. So again, uh, thank you so much, Don, for your time, your expertise. Thank you, everyone. 
sharing with us. Um, please feel free to reach out to him if you do have questions. I know he's always willing to answer any questions, whether it's this topic or anything HR related. Um, and again, stay tuned to the Chamber's uh, website for upcoming events. Thank you all for attending. Very good. Thank you for your questions. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.